Now, it doesn't require expropriation or confiscation of private property or business to impose socialism on a people. What does it mean whether you hold the deed to the, or the title to your business or property if the government holds the power of life and death over that business or property? And such machinery already exists. The government can find some charge to bring against any concern it chooses to prosecute. Every businessman has his own tale of harassment. Somewhere a perversion has taken place. Our natural unalienable rights are now considered to be a dispensation of government. And freedom has never been so fragile, so close to slipping from our grasp as it is at this moment. No, never before as it was at this moment. 26 years before he became president. That speech on behalf of the presidential candidate's candidacy of Senator Barry Goldwater is better remembered than anything Goldwater or LBJ themselves said during that campaign. But by the time he became president, did Ronald Reagan still have small government values in his heart? Take a listen. We're here to speak for millions in our inner cities who long for real jobs, safe neighborhoods, and schools that truly teach. We're here to speak for the American farmer, the entrepreneur, and every worker in industries fighting to modernize and compete. Sounds a bit like he may have changed his tune once he got into office. Still with us, historian Tom Woods and historian Monica Crowley and journalist Nick Gillespie. Was he the father of modern-day big government conservatism, or was he the libertarian that we all thought he would oh, be we, when we were kids in, in the 60s? Yeah, now, he was no libertarian, and that's for sure. In an interview with my magazine, Reason, in 1975, he said, libertarianism is the heart and soul of conservatism, and I'm no libertarian. So we, we had it on record 10 years before, 15 years before he took office. He created the modern warfare state. What people don't give him enough bad credit for he also jacked up the modern welfare state. This is a guy who, who fixed Social Security, an immoral system that screws over poor people most of all. He is bad on all counts. Why do we love him so? Was it the sunny disposition, the marvelous personality, the tremendous difference between him and Jimmy Carter in terms of the way we looked at the presidency and, and even looked at ourselves? Well, I think he had a tremendous emotional connection with the American people, and he was unafraid to stand up for conservative principles. Any, any presidency is going to be a complex mix of, of compromise and principle. Reagan was better than most. He did cut taxes, he did cut regulation, he wanted a strong dollar, he let Volcker raise interest rates to try to tame inflation. He did do all of that. Here was his mistake. His mistake was that he brokered a deal with the Democrats. He said, okay, I will go for tax increases, but for every dollar of tax increases, you're going to commit to two dollars in, in Well, they never went cuts. along with that. And the Democrats betrayed him and they never right. went with the Democrats. All cuts. right, Tom Woods, you probably don't agree with anything that Monica just said. Well, I mean, almost all the deregulation, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, occurred actually under Jimmy Carter sure. before uh, Reagan even took office. The taxes on net, the taxes went up if you look at it over. I mean, yeah, we had the marginal tax rate reductions, but you got the payroll taxes, you got the 86 Reform Act, you got the closing of the loopholes. So, and, in fact, basically the Congress more or less approved the Reagan budgets with only marginal changes. So I have a soft spot in my heart for him because I loved his speeches, I loved his rhetoric, but we cannot let him become the rights Obama, where we love him because he makes us feel good. No, we have to be cold and calculating as historians when we evaluate. Right. I, I love him, too, because he made us feel good. But was he, was he a, a more small government, natural rights thinker, in 64, which is long before he's governor of California, 26 years before he becomes president, than he was in, in 1984 uh, when he was running for re-election, Tom? It's hard to say. I mean, when he, was, when he took over as governor of California, he did not govern California as a small government conservative. So I mean, something happened. I don't think we can judge the man from just the one speech. C clearly, he did seem to believe, by and large, that the New Deal programs were here to stay, and he, he wasn't even going to repeal the Department of Education, which he pledged to do. His, yeah, his 1980 uh, campaign platform was called the New Federalism. He was going to break things up and give block grants to states and take power out of Washington. He ended up consolidating power in a way that and Jimmy Carter couldn't even dream of in doing. In the third paragraph of his first inaugural address, he says, I would remind you that the states formed the federal government and not, not the, the other, other way, way around. around. Now, That's right. Didn't that caused those of us who believe that the federal government is one of limited power, didn't that make our hearts leap? Yes. And then didn't our hearts sink? Yes, yes.
President Nixon had a phrase about this. He said, look, when presidents are candidates and in their first term, they're warriors. That's why you got that 1964 clip from him. Right. They're warriors and they can afford to stick to their principles. By their second term, they want to be known in their legacy as peacemakers, whether it's domestically by giving away the store got or it. in terms of peace treaties with foreign, got it. foreign enemies. Tom Woods, Monica Crowley, Nick Gillespie, it's been a great hour on the American presidency. We'll do it again next year. Thank you for joining us. Coming up. The plain truth on presidential mythology and you. Work on behalf of the people or do the people exist for the benefit of the government? Is history a recollection of things that have actually happened or a narrative deploys to legitimize power and the crimes that led to the acquisition of that power? Tonight on this President's Day, state-sanctioned history, the presidents of the United States and you. In the last hour, we've heard that some of the presidents often billed by historians and the public as the greatest were anything but. To be fair, it's difficult to be a great president when your job is to head an organization like the state that is rooted in deception, theft, and murder. And we know from Lord Acton that no great man is a good man. From the beginning, any claim that the American government is good because Americans are exceptional does not make any sense. The individual virtues of human beings cannot possibly extend to the government. By definition, the government lies, cheats, and steals. After all, it has no resources of its own, only those it appropriates from the people. No one may lawfully compete with it. We are forced to pay its bills and accept its so-called services. There is no escaping it. The ideas behind a nation may be exceptional, but they are not manifested by the government. And of course, we must never mistake the government for the people it claims to represent. So why does the official history of our presidents seem like so much mythology and legend when viewed side by side with what really happened. Is history being deliberately manipulated to whitewash the crimes of the past and manufacture the consent of the people? Or is whitewashing of history simply a natural reaction by a people and a culture that would rather not come to terms with their not so rosy past? It's both. It is human instinct to trivialize the dark and wicked in us and to elevate the good and the honorable in us. But indeed, the history transmitted to you and your children in government schools has whitewashed all the presidents but a few. And make no mistake about it, they are government schools because they all exist at the pleasure of the state so that the government's version of history becomes the popular version of history. Napoleon understood this when he remarked that history is not the record of what has happened before us. It is the record of what people think has happened before us. The government understands this too. Franklin Roosevelt manipulated the United States into World War II for years prior to a declaration of war. The Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 was not only not a surprise, but was facilitated by FDR. Abraham Lincoln was a racial supremacist who wanted blacks forcibly removed to Africa. Woodrow Wilson arrested people for speaking German in public. If these facts were as well known as the fiction that has surrounded them, then the information which the government wishes us to accept uncritically about the present day state of affairs would be more vigorously challenged. So here is the lesson. The government has mythologized the past in order to lull us into accepting its version of the present. And the essence of that mythology is the American presidency. When Lincoln stated at Gettysburg that the government is of the people, by the people, and for the people, that was government propaganda. The government is not of the people, and it does not share the characteristics and traits of the people themselves. No less a president than George Washington told us that government is not reason, it is force. Government is a tool, a powerful and dangerous tool, and so it must be wielded carefully and only when moral, constitutional, necessary, and proper. Government officials are not performing a public service and they don't regard themselves as public servants. They regard themselves as our masters. Under the Constitution and the law, and I've said this time and time again on Freedom Watch, they are the employees of the people and they ought to serve at our pleasure. When we lionize our government officials, be they presidents or postal workers, when we mythologize and deify them, when we build temples to worship them, we violate the nature of the service they ought to be performing. Jefferson would be scandalized at the temples we have built for him. Lincoln and FDR, they might welcome theirs. If we want to take our government back, we must begin by taking an honest account of what our government has done. 
ostensibly in our names, and reject the narratives it instead foists upon us. The truth shall set us free. All presidents but Jefferson have argued that their first job was to keep us safe. All presidents but Jefferson were wrong. If you read the Constitution, you will see that the president's first job, as Jefferson understood it well, is to keep us free. From New York, defending freedom every night of the week. So long, America.